All right. Is there anything still uh, kind of outstanding to folks from last time that we want to uh, revisit or spend a little more time with? Uh, we started with uh, talking about Mark for most of church history was, was kind of frowned upon and uh, seen as second rate. Um, Kim, I see a hand up. Yeah, I think last week it may have been Tom that brought it up um, between Mark and John Mark and which one is this. Um, I did happen to find online um, it's actually cliff notes about the gospel. <laughs> so how accurate it is, I guess, isn't really it. But it does, in their opinion, say that the author of Mark is John Mark, that they are one and the same. Okay. Do we, but do we know if that's really the same or? We, we don't know. I, I don't suppose they cite a source on that, do they? Or explain oh, of why? Of course they? not. Cliff. <laughs> Cliff is the source. <laughs> yeah. uh, remember, Cliff is not a scholarly peer-reviewed uh, source of material. Um, oh, for sure. Nor is Wikipedia. Uh, but reading it is pretty... Um, pretty much what we were talking about when I read the, the notes. It's like, yeah, it's kind of what we talked about last week. So good. does anyone remember uh, from last week, if all we have to go on is the text of Mark itself, what does it tell us about the author? I think you said it was written, written away from Jerusalem, if I remember correctly. Yeah, likely, likely not written in Palestine. And uh, and you also said if it was John Mark, he would have had to have been exceedingly old. He, he would have been pretty ancient by the time he got around to writing it. Yes. Um, the like all of the Gospels, Mark is anonymous. Um, there was an early tradition that put the name Mark with it, uh, so it has been known as the Gospel of Mark for most of its life. Um, but the text itself is uh, is anonymous. You know, Paul, of course, says, hey, it's me, Paul, and I'm writing you this letter. Um, in Revelation, it starts off, hi, my name is John. I had a vision. Let me tell you about it. Mark says, here's the story of Jesus. And then he goes into it. Um, so re really, it's anonymous, and people have, you know, tried to make the case that it is uh, either Mark or John Mark mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. You can see how some of that would make sense because one of them, I don't remember which one, we know from Acts and from some of the other references, he knew both Peter and Paul. So those are both pretty good people to get the story of Jesus from. Um, but really, we know not a heck of a lot about who wrote it. Um, we can deduce some things about Matthew, about Luke, about John, about what was going on in their community. Mark, I think, really is trying to answer the question, who is Jesus? And people could be asking that question in any number of places. So um, it could have been Mark or John Mark. It could have just as easily been anyone else. Um, we, we don't know. We do know, and I hope by the time we are done studying the Gospel of Mark, that this person knew exactly what he or she was doing writing the book the way the way he did. So I, I hope to make that case to you. But uh, uh, other other things still hanging out or, or in need of a little more uh, insight from last week. So, um, we started, we talked a little bit about how do we understand what type of book are we reading here? And again, that is important because uh, the example I like to use is uh, with Genesis, for example. Um, if you read Genesis as a science book, you are going to get a very, very different meaning from it than if you read it as a 
theological interpretation of origins. Um, I think one of those is a little more faithful to the uh, what the authors probably intended it to be. Um, and so how we read the book makes a difference. And we talked about Mark, as far as we know, invented the genre of the gospel, which uh, comes from a word that means a good, a pronouncement of good news. Um, and so for Mark, it is, the gospel is the power of God at work in Jesus when people tell the story. Um, Matthew and Luke thought Mark did such a compelling job that they said, we're going to take somewhere between 75 and 90% of what he wrote, and we're going to incorporate it into our own work. Um, so if we read it as a gospel, we read it as a pronouncement of good news. We are hearing something that is supposed to tell us about what God is up to. This is the power of God at work in this story. But we also said it shares some important uh, characteristics with the way people wrote biographies at the time Mark was written. It was not just a, not just an account of here's the stuff that happened in a person's life. Here are the things that shaped this person, but it is told in a way it wasn't just, you know, Nick was born here. These were the experiences that shaped him. These were the great things Nick did. An ancient biography would say those things and say, and Nick was a really great person. And if there were more people out there like Nick, the world would be a better place. We hope that by reading the story of his life, it will inspire you to be more like Nick. So the, the biography has as its purpose to get the reader to want to emulate the good qualities of the person it's about. So if we keep that in the back of our minds, so we've talked about who is Mark, we talked about, we talked briefly about when is Mark. We talked about uh, what is Mark. We're going to hit the last question word that starts with W tonight. Uh, how we're going to be in for a couple weeks. So uh, why is Mark? If you recall the book of Acts, we had that one key verse that kind of guided us through the whole book. In Mark's gospel, we have something uh, kind of similar. There's one verse that kind of... Um, packs a lot of the key concepts in, and he puts it right at the beginning, and we see, I think if we think about that, it really helps us understand the purpose of his book. So with that, let us turn to our texts. Uh, let us turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Carol, will you share that with us, please? Uh, and, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So uh, I would say that everything there that is in quotation marks is a key word or key idea that we need to spend a little bit of time with. Um, how, how might we break that up? How might we divide that into kind of four key ideas what would we what would we label each of those well just the one few outlines here the time is fulfilled kingdom of god repent and believe in the gospel absolutely absolutely i like using the resources so this is Jesus speaking, who says, the time is fulfilled. Um, when we think about fulfillment, what kind, of, what kind of God stuff do we think about when we think fulfillment? Salvation. Right. So salvation, certainly. But salvation doesn't come out of nowhere. There are people who kind of point us in that direction first, right? Yeah. John the Baptist. Right. We've got John, and John, of course, builds on the legacy of the prophets. So 
the idea of the time is fulfilled, it's kind of that sense of all those things the prophets talked about. And they said, God is going to do this. The time is fulfilled. God is doing this now. We have switched from God is going to, to right now, God is at work doing this. Um, some of you have probably heard, uh, you know, there are multiple words for love in Greek. Uh, and my guess is you have probably been misled to the extent that, you know, of how different they are. They, there's more overlap than most clergy are willing to admit. Similarly, there are multiple words for time in ancient Greek. Uh, there is chronos, which is like a uh, chronology. You know, it's time like we usually think of it. It goes in one direction and it moves at a consistent rate. When we talk about it takes this long for something to happen, um, you know, that's, that's chronos time. But the word here is kairos. It means a specific time. It means an appointed time. It is um, the moment when something specific is meant to happen. So when he says the time is fulfilled, he is saying God's time, the time God wants to make all of these things spring into action is now. So we have entered, uh, and, and in Judaism, in some branches of Judaism today, there's also this idea of a difference between the present and the age to come. Uh, Christians usually don't use that language. We talk about the kingdom of God. But um, this idea that the present age is kind of coming to its fulfillment in what God is doing, and we are at the threshold of the age to come. Maybe we could call it the messianic age. Um, and we know from verse 1, we know from chapter 1, verse 1, the Messiah is this guy, Jesus. Mark tells us that right off the bat. Um, so the time is fulfilled. Some, God has something significant going on, and it is happening now. The next key idea that we're going to have to follow through here is the kingdom of God. Um, I will be so bold as to say that I do have something in common with Jesus. I like to talk about the kingdom of God, um, not as authoritatively as, as Jesus does, obviously, but, um, who, who wants to take a stab at what what kingdom of God refers to? We we got a lot of content out of the time is fulfilled. We'll get at least as much out of kingdom of God. Who wants to uh, get the ball rolling on the kingdom of God? His presence with us, right? So it is it is God's presence among us in any particular way. Kind of like a, a spiritual way through Jesus. So yeah, it is definitely, uh, definitely through Jesus. Jesus is the one who comes in and proclaims this kingdom. So if we, if we live in a kingdom, what does it mean in terms of who has a an important say in how our lives run? God. God, the reign of God on earth is what I define kingdom of God. Yes, the reign of God on earth. And those last two words are particularly important. Uh, let me let me dispel this notion in case anybody is, is unclear on it. Jesus is not talking about heaven. Jesus is not talking about an afterlife. Jesus is talking about, um, and of course, kingdom is not, He's not saying, you know, this geographic place is God's, you know, God's little state. He is saying, he is using kingdom in terms of wherever people acknowledge and faithfully respond to the rule of the king, that's the kingdom of God. When people begin acting like God's actually in charge, that's the kingdom of God. And he says, that is right here the kingdom of god has come near it is right over the horizon the time when all of creation will recognize and respond to god as king um 
it so people like it sounds like it has a quite similarity to the time it's fulfilled for the time being um a precedent or the, the apparent time at this point in time in kingdom of god being when people are willing to respond and the thing in the, in the events have occurred almost sound like the same yes they, they are definitely related the the arrival or the establishment of the kingdom we've been looking forward to this for a long time and the the time is now absolutely uh and the time being fulfilled that also adds a a an edge of uh urgency or immediacy and as we look at how mark tells the story in the next couple of weeks uh urgency or immediacy are going to be right at the forefront of how he approaches that um so people also translate the phrase reign of god empire of god regime of god it's the idea that it is a any time or place where people acknowledge god's rule and respond faithfully um and of course anytime you are talking about the kingdom of god or the empire of god if you are living under a place that calls itself an empire and somebody says well actually whatever empire is going on now is is on its way out god's empire is is here and taking over that has the potential to be uh, an inflammatory stance um so even something that we think sounds kind of run of the mill kingdom of god we're very familiar with it um that that has an edge to it that has a bite to it as well so the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god has come near repent uh who here listened carefully to the sermon on sunday what what do we know about repentance turn exactly uh it, it is to turn um in greek it's metanoia it's a a turning or a change of mind uh, so like metamorphosis a, a change of form metanoia change of mind in hebrew uh the word is shuv and it means to turn around like i was walking towards the edge of a cliff and i realized i was going to fall off of it so i turned around um uh, it's it's a very very literal word uh in hebrew there's this idea of halakha it's like the notion of walking a faithful path because faith isn't just a theory, it is how you move life so if you are walking and you find out you know what i'm not walking in a faithful direction you repent you turn and you move in the faithful direction um there may be an element of stopping and confessing and saying god i have not done this before but repent is not just oh i'm so terrible i have done this terrible thing and i feel so bad y you can do that if you want but what's more important in what jesus is saying is you you got to change your approach you got to change how you are living this out um so repent jesus is saying because the kingdom of God is here, this calls for you to do things differently. Um, and the final key idea, and like I said, this verse is, there's a lot here. There's a lot here to work with. Um, believe in the gospel. How might we, how do we understand that? I would suppose that we believe the good news are the message that Jesus Christ is giving to us. Right. So absolutely. You need to, it, it is in relation to, to Jesus. Now, when we say believe, I always like to think about that in terms of trust. It is not, you know, I, I believe in the theory of gravity. I, I assent to the notion that that thing is true. Um, you know, it's very easily demonstrated. You know, I pick up something heavy and it falls on my foot. So when we're using it in a faith context, I think trust is an important part of that. We need to trust that Jesus, we need to trust this proclamation that God's at work in Jesus. And I think based on the idea of 
because it is linked to the idea of repent, I think it also carries with it the notion of you need to trust that God is at work in Jesus and you need to trust it to such an extent that it influences how you live and impacts the choices you make. So again, you know, I, I believe in gravity. I trust that that is actually true. That impacts my life. Um, the shelf back here. I found a stud to mount the shelf on because I believe in gravity. If I just put a nail in the drywall and hang the shelf on it, I believe that gravity is going to pull it down and I'm going to have a mess to clean up. Um, you know, we, we make many choices based on, on gravity. Um, I'm selective about when I get down on the floor because gravity wants to keep me there. Same thing here. We need to trust what God is up to in Jesus. We need to trust the power of God at work in him to the extent that it influences how we live. If we think of Mark in terms of a biography, we remember that biographies at this time were written differently. What, what might we conclude is the purpose of Mark's book? Why does he write this book? What is he trying to accomplish? To get us to live as Jesus live, and that's the whole ancient part of it, right, is to emulate him. So we're supposed to try to be as close to him as we can be. Yeah, the, the story of this life should change the way we live. It is supposed to provoke a response from us. Um, it provokes a response from us because... The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is near. The time to respond is growing short. Um, Jesus is kind of the embodiment of that kingdom that is about to arrive fully. And I think Mark is inviting us to shape our lives around that truth. So I think absolutely, I, I think Mark you know, when we read Matthew, we think Matthew's purpose was to say, we're all, we're all Jewish people. We're all faithful people. Some of us believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Others don't. And my purpose is to help you understand that, yes, Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. I think Mark, I think his purpose is, I want you to know the story of Jesus so that you can trust it and so that it can shape your life. And we're going to come back to, we're going to come back to some, a couple ways that Mark tries to impress that upon us tonight. Um, let me stop there. Let me stop there and pause for questions, comments, observations, and to slake my thirst, because I've been talking a lot. On, on the first, on the first theme, on the time is fulfilled, that, kind of rang a bell um, with, and I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of the scriptures, unfortunately, and, and also my brain is getting old, which would make that even more difficult. But it seems to me that there was a place somewhere in, in one of Paul's letters where it was stated at the appointed time, at the appointed time by God, that would be when you know, whenever he thought it was correct for man's relationship with God, that he would introduce his son to the, um, to the equation, Jesus. So I just thought that that here in Mark being the right time has come is, um, is significant because that was stated somewhere else and that was referred to as the, at the appointed time that God would, uh, would bring Jesus into the world. Yes, I, I'm looking at Ephesians. I thought it was at the beginning of Ephesians. Paul, Paul definitely says that, and um, off the top of my head, I can't say where. It's not in the first chapter of Ephesians, I can tell you that, but that notion that 
God has a specific sense of that time, yeah, that is that is all over the New Testament. So it's good to see that there is some uh, uh, some consistency with that. Absolutely. Other thoughts? Um, you know, I remember reading a long time ago someplace that the Jesus community was concerned in about 60 AD, 65 AD, that Jesus has come and gone. All these people who followed him are dying away and nothing is written. Mm -hmm. So there was some urgency for Mark to write something down, complete or not complete. We got to put something down. Otherwise, there won't be anything written for the future generation. Is that a valid supposition? I, I think to an extent, I think to an extent it might be. Um, certainly by the time Mark is writing, people who were that first generation who were there and actually saw Jesus were going to be pretty few and far between. Um, you know, Paul was writing about 20, you know, 10, 15, 20 years after Jesus, and Mark was a little after that. So there may have been some urgency to um, kind of get the witness of people who were there and saw it firsthand. Um, I think there may be a little bit less urgency. I, I think the, um, the drive to kind of get the story I, I think was definitely in play. I think the need to get it in writing is maybe a, was maybe a little less for these folks than it would be for us. Um, so many people did not have the ability to read and to write, um, but a lot of people had a much, much better capacity for remembering and retelling important stories accurately. Um, so yeah, I think there was there would absolutely have been uh, some impetus to, hey, you know what? There's not that many people left who actually talked with Jesus and saw him do these things. Let's talk to them. There's some in our community. Let's find out. Um, there may have been a little less um, pressure to get it written down because when things were important, people were often able to relay that story um, with a I think to us, a surprising degree of accuracy. So I, I think uh, timing, I think somewhat um, invited Mark to uh, put this together. Um, that's, my, that's my thought. I see a hand up. Rob. Would that be Ephesians 1.10? I don't know, you tell me. Um, it says here, um, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Is that the one you're talking about? Right. We definitely get an, an idea, the fullness of time, the fulfillment of time. Yes. I think, I think there is another, another place that it does say what Tom was thinking, something about, you know, at, at the appointed moment, God did this in Christ. Oh. Um, but yeah, certainly in Ephesians, we get that idea because Ephesians talks about this was planned out before the foundation of the world. You people don't need to worry because God has your salvation planned out, you know, since God did any creating. Anything else before we go to our, our text here? I have a question. Yes. Um, reading through the book here, it often said that the disciple, you know, Jesus would preach these things and they just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess when the guy is doing miracles daily and what he says comes true and they still don't seem to understand who he is or what his mission is, it, it kind of uh, throws me off a little bit. What more proof did they need? Well, I, I think there's a, off the top of my head, there's a couple of things going on here. Um, I think one of them has, one of them I believe we'll uncover a little later tonight. The general 
consensus is that as the gospels so if mark is the earliest gospel as the gos as time goes on the gospel authors are kinder to the apostles because now we are living in the apostolic age we are living in the time when all we have to go on is the story that these people told um so mark is the earliest and he depicts the gospel the disciples at certain points not from start to finish but at certain points as being a little bit not quite able to grasp what's going on in jesus um i think some of that has to do with the fact that jesus is not what people expect as a messiah um, we're going to see that in a moment but I, I think that has something to do with it that jesus is not um when people thought messiah they did not imagine jesus and what he did so i think that's that's part of it certainly jack <clears throat> that's one of the two great struggles that i see that jesus has in mark <clears throat> he's fighting satan and the demons and he's fighting the expectations of his own disciples and their ignorance and that basically he's trying to defeat one and to educate the other mm -hmm. and yeah. and that's that's what that's why i said this mark is a this jesus in mark is a combative kind of guy but he he has an educational fight as well as a fight against the the powers of the devil yes mark's mark's jesus does not like to sit still for long and chat he he's got more more belligerent things to do so if if this is true that mark wants to provoke a response that get it gets us to get our lives kind of in line with this coming kingdom of God, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if he gave us some examples of what that looks like? Let's see if he does. Um, Kim, will you share with us uh, Mark 1, 16 through 18, uh, Jack uh, 1, 19 through 20, and Nick, if you can share with us uh, chapter 2, 13 and 14. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishing. They were fishermen. <clears throat> and Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Okay. Jesus went out again to try to see. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. So. A lot of following. <laughs> yes. So Mark depicts, these are some positive examples. So right at the beginning of Mark, we see some, we see the disciples held up as, yes, these are people we want to be like. By the end of the book, we don't really want to be like the disciples, but we're not there yet. What, if you had to set an outline that kind of described each of these three call stories, what would be the main points? What are, what are the, what's the sequence that happens? Jesus sees, Jesus calls, the disciples follow. Jesus sees, absolutely. So Jesus takes the initiative. Let, let me insert one in the middle there. What are people up to? when Jesus goes and, and sees them? Their daily lives, their, their, their work. Yeah, uh, you know, it doesn't say Jesus went to the temple on Yom Kippur and talked to the high priest and got him to follow him. Jesus does not say he went out to where the, 
the hermits were living in the desert uh, or anything like that. He's walking by the lake shore and he sees people at work. So Jesus sees, Jesus takes the initiative. Jesus comes to people where they are. Jesus enters into the midst of everyday life. And Jesus calls, follow me. Um, chapter, uh, verse 17, we do get a nice uh, explanation from Jesus. I will make you fish for people. So he talks about the, um, the call to share in his mission. We don't get that in the others, uh, but that's kind of nice to throw in there. And, and what is the response from people that Kim touched on already? Oh. Yeah. So if Mark is trying to get us to follow Jesus, he gives us some examples. Um, you know, Jesus takes the initiative. Jesus reaches out. Jesus reaches out through the story of what he does, too. So there is initiative from Jesus. People. He meets them where they are. They're in the midst of their everyday, ordinary lives. There is a clear summons from Jesus. It doesn't get much clearer than, follow me. Um, and there is an immediate response. People leave what they're doing. Simon and Peter leave what they're doing. James and John leave what they're doing. That's the family business. We think they're likely somewhat successful. They have their own boat and they have in uh, Matthew and Luke, they have servants who are work, or they have hired men. No, it says right there. Um, so they're, they're not destitute. They're not saying, hey, anything's better than this. Uh, they walk away from, you know, probably at least a moderately comfortable life. Um, Levi, the tax collector, tax collectors were typically known to be fairly comfortable um, uh, because of the presence of graft. Um, Do we know of any foundation? County or not? Any foundation? Do we know any foundation oh, about this? Like, had these people been listening to Jesus preach? Had they questioned him? Had he, had he talked to them before? Because when you, when you read this, I remember reading this when I was a little kid in Bible school, it was like, oh, hey, what a miraculous thing. He's walking down the street and just calls these people out of the blue. I would seem that there's probably a little bit of a backstory to this. Yeah, what what do people think about that? Well, Jesus has been preaching in the Capernaum region, which is the background for all these guys. So these guys have probably heard about him, heard him talk, they thought about him, figured out he is son of God or or a great uh, prophet, and they were ready. I, I, you know, I would imagine this is kind of Mark is kind of paraphrasing taking the long story short, saying, I called them and they came right away. Probably not that. There's probably some discord. What do you mean? What do you want me to do? Are you serious? I mean, if somebody calls me to follow them, I wouldn't follow them without asking questions. Right. So yeah, Jesus has already been preaching in the region. So there is definitely the possibility they have heard about this guy, Jesus, and they might even go, the Jesus wants me to follow him? Hey, how can I pass that up? That's certainly a possibility. Jesus my is spec living. My speculation has always been that perhaps uh, Jesus knew it was in their heart because he had watched them and saw how they reacted and read them and, and, and knew that these were the ones I am going to call when the time is right. Yeah, Jesus, I, I think... Even if we were having this discussion with some some uh, atheist people, I think anyone who takes the fact that Jesus made a big impact on the world seriously would have to think, if nothing else, Jesus had a very sharp awareness of what made people tick. Um, so I think there there might have been some of that. And like Nick said, Mark is giving us highlights. Maybe there were other people. Maybe Jesus was walking down the street and said, hey, Fred, follow me. And Fred said, no, no, not happening. Um, he doesn't tell us that. So, yeah, maybe they heard Jesus preach. Maybe Jesus approached these people because he had a sense of these are the guys I'm looking for. It could have been that they had known each other for a while from living in town. <laughs> um, John, you, you wanted to? Uh, throw something else in there? 
Yeah, I, I think I think this is a little dangerous. I think we're starting to conflate the Gospels. I think you have to take Mark, ex, um, basically what is only in Mark, and not conjecture too much because my conjecture might be that Jesus was a uh, one of John the Baptizer's disciples, and then these guys knew him because they were also in the circle of John the Baptizer. And okay. there's no basis. There's no basis of fact in the material. So mm -hmm. if you start completing Matthew and Luke with Mark and saying this is a possibility, that's one thing. But if you start to say this is what happened then you've got an issue. Right. I don't well, think I you don't... can merge them. Okay. I, I think, I I think, think you, have, you have to take it. Go ahead. Yeah. We definitely want to make sure, you know, so we're clear on what Mark is trying to accomplish here. Yeah. We don't <laughs> want to, uh, you know, read across too much in the other gospels. I think everything we've mentioned so far, we know that, so, uh, Jack, like you said, this takes place after the ministry of John the Baptist, and we know Jesus was out there. Maybe they're all John the Baptist people. They're like, hey, we know that guy from, from church, so to speak. But Jesus is already out there preaching, so I think there is a possibility they've heard that. Um, you know, Jesus is really has tremendous power. Uh, at the beginning of Mark, the way he goes and um, casts out demons and heals people. I think there's also the possibility that um, the other possibility I'll throw out there before we, we uh, keep going. Um, Jesus, I suspect, was really charismatic. Um, and that might have something to do with it, too. I, I think Jesus probably just had a I don't know if aura is the right word, but I think his his presence and personality may have been such that people people would follow him. And you might go, no, come on, Eric, that, that doesn't really happen. Um, yes, it does. Have we ever heard of Jim Jones? Have we ever heard of David Koresh? Um, we tend to think that these guys are nuts. Um, and And history may prove that, but... Um, they they would walk to people and talk to him and say, follow me. And people would follow him. I am <laughs> not saying Jesus is like Jim Jones, but I'm saying within recent memory, there have been people who have that kind of charisma. Perhaps Jesus was operating on that as well. Um, I'm just, just throwing ideas out there. The truth is, I think Mark tells the story the way he does because he wants to lift it up as an example. Like, these are the guys who get it right. Jesus finds them where they're at, says, follow me, and they understand my priorities have shifted. God's kingdom is now number one, and that means doing the Jesus thing. So I think that's why he tells it. How it happened, um, it, it's fascinating to try and understand, but we at least right here, don't have a ton to go on. Um, you know, maybe what Nick said is is the, the best answer we can lean on from the text, that um, Jesus has already been preaching in the area. So maybe they say, oh, yeah, we know that guy. He's We got to follow him. Um, who else wants to jump in on this? Anybody? So... Um, how, however, however this happened, I think the disciples here, these five disciples are lifted up as an example. So Mark's purpose is we want to bring the story of Jesus to you where you're at so that you change your life to get in line with it. Hey, look in the story, there's people who do that. Jesus comes to them where they're at and they drop what they're doing and change their lives and follow him. Um, so that, that's how he works with the disciples. Um, I want to take a look at uh, some interaction Jesus has with some people who are not disciples or, or who are not apostles. Uh, 
Robin, will you share with us um, chapter one, verses 32 through 34? Uh, Tom, will you share with us chapter 1, 40 through 45? And Fred, will you share with us chapter 3, verses 7 through 12? That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Okay. What do we see a little further down, Tom? A man suffering from a dreaded skin disease came to Jesus, knelt down and begged him for help. If you want to, he said, you can make me clean. Jesus was filled with pity and reached out and touched him. I do want to, he answered, be clean. At once the disease left the man and he was clean. Then Jesus spoke sternly to him and sent him away at once after saying to him, listen, don't tell anyone about this, but go straight to the priest and let him examine you. Then in order to prove to everyone that you are cured, Offer the sacrifice that Moses ordered. But the man went away and began to spread the news everywhere. Indeed, he talked so much that Jesus could not go into a town publicly. Instead, he stayed out in lonely places and people came to him from everywhere. All right. And to make it three for the Trinity, uh, Fred, what do we see in chapter three there? Jesus withdrew his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan. Idumea and the regions oh, across the Jordan and around Thyre and Sid Sidon. Because the crowd he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. So we looked a little bit about, you know, this is kind of, the apostles are held up as a positive example. Um, what is the common factor with all the people Jesus interacts with uh, in these instances? And what is the response uh, that they have to Jesus? So they didn't, they didn't well, listen. They didn't listen to him when he asked not to tell anybody. Um, like in the in the uh, verses that I read, he right. basically was a big a big blabbermouth, I guess. To... So we we have some people that possibly remind us of of our seven year olds. Sometimes they don't follow directions. Um, so we have that. Um, what? Um, before Jesus interacts with these people, what do they all have in common? Yeah. They all need to be healed. Right. These, these people are all very aware of their need. They are sick. They are struggling with demons, and we can understand that in whatever way we want to. That's a, that's a discussion for a different night. Um, they are trying to press in on him just so they can lay a hand on him to get healing. Um, these people are all very aware of their own need. And what is their response to Jesus? Please heal us. They trust in him. They trust in him. They say, please heal us. They, they, they go to him. They flock to him. So people who understand their own need for healing, they welcome Jesus. 
They, they don't just welcome Jesus. They go out and get him to the point where Jesus says, I'm getting in a boat so you people don't trample me. So people who are aware of their own brokenness welcome Jesus because he has this power, because he brings this healing with him. Um, so that's, that's another way that people respond to Jesus. And so maybe Mark is saying, if you're aware that you need healing and that you need help, one way to respond is to invite Jesus, is to seek him out. Um, why don't you start by reading my book? Um, uh, most ancient authors, by the way, were not paid on, Mark probably wasn't paid. He did this as an act of faith. But most authors and artists were paid a single fee when the uh, book was written, and then as many copies were made as people wanted. Um, so when I'm saying, Mark is saying, read my book, it's not that Mark wants to earn royalties. Mark wants people to know about Jesus. Um, so I, I just want to make that clear um, for, for folks. So we have another response to Jesus. If you are aware of your own need, um, welcoming Jesus is, is the faithful thing to do. Now, I don't know about any of you. Uh, I know that uh, in many areas of my life, I have learned from mistakes. Um, sometimes having an example of what not to do is equally, uh, equally helpful. Why don't we go ahead and turn to that? This is how not to respond to Jesus. And we're going to start to understand why these people respond to Jesus the way they do. Um, Andrew, will you share with us uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7? Uh, Lindsay, if you can share with us chapter 3, verse 6. I will take chapter 6, 1, 2, and 3. And Carol, if you can share with us... Um, Chapter fourteen, verse one. So, what do we what do we see in these citations here? Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, "Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone?" The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So out of chapter 6, he, Jesus, left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power? are being done by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. It was, it was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. So what is the what is the response that all these people have to Jesus? Well, they just don't believe him and they would just as soon see him dead. Yeah, they definitely don't believe him. They they want to get rid of him uh, in one way or another. They either want to uh, throw him out of the synagogue or silence him or they, they just want to get him killed. Um, so the, this is, again, this is how not to respond to Jesus. But why is it that these particular people have that response to Jesus? He is a threat to their status quo. Will, I think that is also a, a symptom. I think uh, definitely by the time they get to Jerusalem and Pilate is sitting there with his legions and he says, Really, you, you people want to make trouble. You go ahead and see what happens. Um, absolutely, he is a threat to the status quo. Um, but I think even before we get to that point, um, it's like in chapter two. Why does this fellow speak this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
if you are saying that, what what is your um, what is your openness to God doing new things likely if you're making that statement? I like the old yeah. Hold on. Wait. I heard Andrew and I heard Jack. One one at a time. Jack, what, what were you saying? You're not open to anything but the the way you've been taught. You, mm -hmm. you have a certain degree of expectation. And this guy's coming from left field. He's coming from Galilee, and nothing good comes out of Galilee. Uh, uh, who's conflating gospels now, Jack? I know I'm guilty of that right there, but I enjoy oh. it. Uh, Andrew, what what were you thinking? Uh, I, I I really have no more to add to it now. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I you guys feel like they've got. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So isn't this common sense? Only God can forgive. So this man is forgiving. That means this this man must be God, at least son of God. It's not common sense to derive at that conclusion. Right. Um, and and I think that idea that yeah, we we've always understood only God can do this. And now this guy comes in and says he can do this. Who's to say that God can't? give someone else the authority to forgive sins. I think these guys are saying, you know what? We understand God. We've got all, God all figured out. And this guy does not fit within what we have figured out. Therefore, this is blasphemy. Um, when we get to chapter three, the Pharisees. The Pharisees are people we meet again and again. And remember, the Pharisees' big thing is, we don't live in Jerusalem, all of us. What do we do to be faithful from day to day? Um, the Pharisees are very interested in, um, you know, how we, uh, how we live out our faith day to day. Jesus comes in, and I, I should have had us read, on the, read the whole section there. In fact, I'm going to make a note to fix that for whenever the next time we do this is. So Jesus has just healed on the Sabbath. The Pharisees say, nope, uh, that counts as work, and we don't do work on the Sabbath. It says it right here in our Bible. We think we have God all figured out. We think we understand what Sabbath means, and this does not fit into that expectation. I think we can say the same thing uh, for chapter 14, the beginning of the Passion Narrative. Um, this guy is saying some crazy stuff about God's empire, and now he's here in a place where people from the Roman Empire are going to hear it. Um, to echo what Andrew said, he is a threat to the status quo. And it's not only part of it probably is we are the Jerusalem elite. We stand to lose something if he rocks the boat. I think part of it also is we also understand that if people rock the boat too much, Pilate comes in here, um, and if Pilate has to come in here with the army, lots of people are going to die, and we do not want that. So, again, it's this idea of we have things figured out. We understand how stuff works, and with some, when something does not jive with what we have figured out, particularly, we have God all figured out, you know? This is how God forgives sins. That's how it works. And this guy doesn't, doesn't go along with our understanding. Wasn't that going to be a big financial issue? Because the temple sold all the uh, animals that you could have for forgiveness. You had to buy your sacrificial animals at the temple. And if now he's going around forgiving sins without someone having to buy a sacrificial animal at your inflated price from your preferred vendors, um, I can see where there's a, a major financial problem here that they can see. Yeah, we have that going on. And Jesus also overturned the tables for the money changers. Um, you were not supposed to bring foreign coinage into the temple because most of them had depictions of other gods. Like the Roman coins had the emperor and said, you know, here's Augustus, he's a god. When your gods 
second commandment is no idols. You don't bring that in there. So the money changers were actually providing a needed service. You would buy proper coinage from the money changers. And of course, they were there to turn a profit. Um, so it's peculiar that Jesus goes and, and thrashes them because they are trying to keep idolatrous stuff out of the temple. But um, that's neither here nor there. So yeah, he, he is a threat to the status quo. He is a threat to some streams of income. Uh, unrest uh, is very bad for business. Um, you, it's hard to collect taxes when people are up in arms. It is hard to have commerce and trade going. Um, the Romans do not want those things to stop. So yeah, that threat to the status quo being tied in economically, yeah, you bet. Uh, Fred, yes. <laughs> <laughs> kind of on the uh, same order, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a Clint Eastwood movie out there. It was actually a while ago. It was called Pale Rider. And uh, he was like a traveling preacher or something, but he wound up in a in a poor uh, community where they were just like uh, uh, looking for gold pieces in the little river. And there was a big land baron, you know, who was using big equipment to bust, you know, to, and he was trying to get them out. And uh, when he came back in town, I, I'll never forget this line. Uh, he says, we almost had them beat. He goes, now this guy comes along and he gives them faith. He mm -hmm. goes, don't want, we don't want them to have faith. So that's, you know, kind of like on Andrew's, you know, thought about the status quo. They didn't want things to change. Right. And it was, you know, I think as with so many things, it was partially, you know, perhaps selfish motive, you know, we know how to work this system, we like it the way it is. And I think part of it was the people said, we, we are the guardians of tradition, this has been handed down from generation to generation, and we want to make sure that we are able to hand this down intact to the next generation. And part of it may have been because we think this is all God's going to do, we think we have it figured out. The people in Jesus hometown come to a similar conclusion, but kind of by a different path. Um, you know, they're impressed. They're, they're astounded at what he's saying in the synagogue. And they say, wait a minute. This is that carpenter guy from down the street. I mean, Mary and Joseph and all, they're, they're like nice enough people, but he can't be the real deal. I mean, we know where he comes from. We, we have this guy figured out. He's just like us. And ain't none of us are the Messiah. So again, among people who thought they had faithful living figured out among people who thought they had Jesus figured out, they do not welcome Jesus. And again, one of the themes that we see is people who should have been the best equipped the priests in the temple, the scribes, the Pharisees, these people who spent all this time studying scripture, they should have seen Jesus coming a mile away. And um, so I think that's one of the themes. The people we expect to, to get it don't. And the people we would not seek out, they welcome Jesus. So we have we, with the apostles and with people who are, are sick or suffering, we see some positive examples of how to respond to what Jesus is doing with people who think they already have it all figured out we see a rejection they say no we, we don't need this jesus thing because we already we already understand how god works um so i think they are held up as the the negative examples um before we get to our last last point here let me stop there thoughts on on that on mark including examples within his book of how to and how not to yeah, so all these people were approaching Jesus for healing because they had ailment, they had sickness. They weren't asking for forgiveness, they're asking for healing. Somehow Jesus connects the healing to forgiveness. Um, so, but this day and age, though, we don't associate sickness because of sin, right? We, right. Yeah, um, 
And yeah, we, we see that in other gospels, that question about what is the relationship between sin and illness. And uh, in John's gospel, Jesus says, no, they're, they're not, they're not related. Um, and here, I think what's going on in Mark at the beginning is Mark is trying to help us understand what Jesus is capable of. Um, and if you trust that Jesus is capable of this and you, um, you react to that, you respond to that by seeking him out, Jesus will use that power on your behalf. I, that, that's my read on what Mark is doing here. Um, and yeah, that, that link between it, it and it is kind of interesting uh, when Jesus uh, Jesus heals the, the man who is paralyzed. They bring the paralyzed guy to Jesus, and Jesus says, Your sins are forgiven. Like, well, that, that's nice, but I'd like to be able to walk. And Jesus says, Well, which is easier? Forgive sin or to tell someone who's paralyzed to get up and walk. But just so you know I'm the real deal, get up and walk. So it, it it's interesting the way Jesus brings it in the direction of forgiveness from sin. Did he do that so that people would start to think, this guy forgives sin. God forgives sin. What is this guy trying to say about himself? Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's not a simple relationship. Um, if it was, we wouldn't still be talking about it 2,000 years later. John, yes. Hey, um, in the early examples, weren't the people also social outcasts? The leper couldn't be part of the community. The, the people possessed by the demons were, were outcasts. And that basically one of the things that we find is that not only is there a healing, but there's kind of a, a social restoration, a kind of mm -hmm. a justice thing. And that's why the leper was told, go, sh go show yourself to the priest so that he could be back in society. Yeah, that's his official yeah. get back into town card uh, when he's right. got the approval from the priest. Um, so that... So the, that's another way of connecting, you know, um, the healing with getting back into a kind of a form of salvation. You can be back in community. Yeah, and you don't have to be on, you don't have to be on the outside anymore. Yeah, salvation is kind of a overarching idea of wholeness. It is not only forgiveness of sin and new life. It is restoration to to life now. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I think there's a lot going on there. Um, in the interest of making sure we get this where we want it to be, let me go to these last two citations, uh, and then we'll take whatever time we have left for other, uh, discussion and questions. Um, so I hope I have made the case to you that at least part of what Mark is doing is putting this story out there to, to provoke a response from us. I think there's one other important way he does this. And to look at that, we are going to look at the very beginning and the very end. So Kim, will you share with us Mark chapter one, verse one? And Jack, will you share with us Mark chapter 16, verses one through eight? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices on so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was huge, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a man, a young man dressed in white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, 
do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where he lay, they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as you, he told you. So they went out and fled to the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were af afraid. So how does chapter 1, verse 1, draw us in and invite us to respond? If you've been listening to the sermons the last week or two, you probably have a leg up. Just plain and simple, you know. Jesus is gospel. Jesus is gospel. Jesus is the Son of God. Right. That's that's good. How does that invite us in? Is is it? When he says the beginning of the good news, is Mark writing there, hey, everybody, this is where my book starts? Well, it seems like as far as he's concerned, that is kind of the beginning when he is baptized. And right. I would make the argument that he is referring to his entire story of Jesus' life. The story of Jesus' life is the beginning of the good news. The whole thing is the start. The next part of it is what you do with it. And I think that idea that we need to step in and we need to respond becomes more clear with the ending. Jesus has said in chapter 13, the gospel must be preached to the whole world. This powerful story of what God is up to needs to go out to everywhere. And Jesus has been doing that the whole time. Well, guess what? Chapter 16, Jesus is nowhere to be found. If this needs to happen, if we need to share this message with the whole world, or let me rephrase that. I tipped my hand. If the message needs to be shared with the whole world uh, and Jesus is out of the picture, who does that task then fall on? All of us. Exactly. So if Jesus is out of the picture, that falls on us. Um, Mark 16, 8 is not a real satisfying ending, but I believe it is not, it is not meant to be an ending. I think it is meant to be, here's where your part of the story begins. And I've always, many people have, have made the point that um, clearly these women did say something to someone at some point or else we wouldn't be here talking about it. Um, but yeah, I really think that, um, Mark begins his work by saying everything that's going on here is a beginning. This is the beginning of the good news. What Jesus does is the beginning of this power of God. And at the end, that power of God doesn't, doesn't just stop, but that power of God now requires our response. Um, let me stop there. Does that... Does that hold water for people? Or are you going, no, Eric, you've, you've totally lost it this time. I go think, ahead, I, think I, I think I can support you. He actually invites them to go back to the place of the beginning. Mm -hmm. To go back to Galilee, where it all started, and get back in touch with the resurrected Jesus at that point. Yep. And so that, so what he's, what he's saying is, Okay, in the beginning, we know it's about the, the life and work ministry of Jesus. Now go back and get in touch with that and then spread it. Yep. That'll preach. And we will, believe me, we will spend some time with 
this ending. Um, and you can probably see in your Bibles, there are <laughs> stuff after that and some extensive footnotes about other endings and stuff. Um, we will talk about why chapter 16, verse 8 actually makes the most sense as an ending based on the way Mark tells the story. Um, so we, we if, if you are a little unsatisfied with that ending, um, I hope to uh, hope to help you understand that. We will no longer be stuck in uh, McJagger's situation and be unable to get no satisfaction. Uh, so so there. Uh, any other anything else from tonight that uh, um, has provoked a response from you? So you're so you're saying that uh, in the future to come we'll we'll be revived. I, I am saying that in, in the near future, when we are studying this, that we will, I believe I will be able to provide you with satisfaction about why this is actually the original ending, even if it seems like it kind of cuts off in the middle. Uh, I'm saying that. And in the future, in the, the, the future that we don't know when it happens, absolutely, we are going to be in the resurrection. So no, I meant I, I meant what you just explained. Uh, oh, very in, good. In our near future of Bible study. Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. I guarantee it, and you can hold me to that. Anything else uh, outstanding from tonight that folks wanna? touch on before we uh, close in prayer. All right, I will take that as a sign of my excellence in teaching. Well, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive we those who trespass, who trespass against, against us. And lead us and lead not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for your thoughtfulness and your participation. And uh, we will see everyone again soon. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.